So my name is Oliver Lane. I work at the Sustainability Hub uh, at UBC Vancouver campus, and I'm co-hosting this session with my colleague, Sarah Kozicki from the Office of Wellbeing Strategy, uh, also located actually in the same building, in the SIRS building, the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability, uh, also on the UBC Vancouver campus. And it's a pleasure to have you all here and, and seeing so much interest in, in the topic of integrated climate integrating climate change and, and well-being, uh, content and pedagogies into our teaching and into our classroom. Um, Sarah and I run a cohort program, uh, and Sarah will, will say a bit more about how this program works and how it started and our partnership. Um, and the panelists that are joining us today are part of that cohort. So a big thank you to the four of you for being with us today, but also for all the work that you're doing in, in your teaching, bringing climate change and well-being into your, into your work. I know that um, a lot of you are joining us, joining us today from different places uh, around the region. So I invite you, if you want to, to share whose indigenous lands you are on right now. You can share that in the chat. If you don't know whose lands you're on, one resource that we recommend is nativeland.ca. It's native-land.ca. You can check out there where uh, it's a, basically a map and you can find the region you're in and share that if you want in the chat. I'm joining today from uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the tsleil nations. I'm in East Vancouver uh, and UBC Vancouver campus, as you know, where, where Sarah and I work, uh, is located on the Musqueam traditional ancestral and unceded lands. And so we, Sarah and I were talking last week about the, about the the connections um, the connections between the topics of discussion today climate change teaching uh, well being and how that's connected to place and to indigenous perspectives and indigenous knowledge um, and and sort of the reality of climate change and how we are impacting other species on this planet how we are interacting with other communities on this planet and how well being is such an important part of how this shapes our interactions, not only as students, but as instructors and as members of the community. So these things, these ideas of place and learning together and well-being really come together so strongly when, we, when we're talking about challenges like climate change that, we're, that we are facing and that we are all facing and having and experiencing climate change in different ways, but also in shared ways. So the, the connections are really big. And, and when I mentioned this last week to my, to my partner at, at dinner, um, I mentioned the, the topics that we were discussing at this session, um, and she mentioned a, a document, a resource that I didn't know about called the First People's Principles of Learning. And I'm sure a lot of you might have heard of this, especially if you are teaching. And we thought, I, I brought this up with, with Sarah, and we looked at the resource, and we thought it was great, and we were uh, hoping to share this with you. And Sarah, I'm not sure if you can put in the links that we have for this. So it's the principles, uh, the First Peoples Principles of Learning um, developed by the First Nations Education Steering Committee. So there's a link to those principles of learning and you see it on one of the, on the slide right now to the, to the right-hand side. And there's another link uh, that Sarah's sharing from Joe Crona, who really takes a deeper dive into these principles and explores them a bit more and actually offers some very concrete examples of how to use these principles and apply these principles in your classroom or in your, in your workplace when you're engaging in conversation and when you're teaching and when you're learning. So I really, uh, I really suggest and recommend that you take a look at these if you haven't seen them before. Uh, and I'll just read from there from one of the websites from the um, where the principles are stated just for some context here. It says these were these principles were articulated by indigenous elders, scholar, indigenous elders, scholars, and knowledge keepers to guide the development of the curriculum and teaching of the English First Peoples course created by the BC Ministry of Education and First Nations Education Steering Committee in 2006, 2007, nearly nearly 20 years ago. They represent an attempt to identify common elements in the varied teaching and learning approaches that prevail. <laughs> with particular First Nations societies. It must be recognized that they do not capture the full reality of the approach used in any single First Peoples society. So there are nine principles here, and I know, uh, Sarah, you wanted to comment on a couple of them that, and, and the connection to our session today. 
Yeah, thanks, Oliver. Um, as we were discussing these principles, there was two that I gravitated to right away, and so I wanted to share those with you. And the first one that you see on the screen, maybe it's a bit small, um, but is uh, directly related to well-being, which is the area that I work in. And I don't think I've ever seen um, such a great articulation between well-being and learning and also a connection beyond just individuals, but the collective and also um, those who have come before us. And so I'll redo that first one. So it's learning ultimately supports the well-being of the self, the family, the community, the land, the spirits and the ancestors. And then the second one that I wanted to share um, is learning is holistic, reflexive, reflective, experiential and relational, focused on connectedness, on reciprocal relationships and a sense of place. And that principle especially resonated with me and I think with a group of panelists as well after we met to discuss how we want to approach the session today. And we all agreed on intentions for our session, um, which also very much corresponds to the intentions of the, the cohort that the faculty are a part of. And it's that our learning should be holistic. It should be reciprocal and relational. And through the interactions of our panelists today, also engagement with those of you who are attending and possibly those who watch the recording later. So we wanted to really um, focus on these, especially given that we're talking about climate and it's not an easy conversation topic sometimes, and also the other interrelated topics that we'll probably get into today that are also very challenging. So we really wanna foster connectedness within this small but mighty group today, um, knowing that others are looking to advance learnings on climate and well-being here at UBC and also beyond. So thanks for showing up here today and, and learning and engaging with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. And I'll just briefly mention the, th the third principle says learning involves recognizing the consequences of one's actions. And of course, I, I gravitate to climate change and, and the collective responsibility and the individual responsibility that we feel that sometimes weighs so, so strongly on our shoulders and is overwhelming. Um, but that is something that we need to explore what, what responsibility means. And one of the things that Joe Crona mentions in their website is, Nurturing the development of empathy and understanding of the interconnectedness of all beings and the land. This helps learners extend their thinking of consequences beyond themselves. That's that's crucial, crucial part of this conversation. Um, another principle, learning involves generational roles and responsibilities. And climate change has that intergenerational thing, that legacy and the the, the impact is gonna is gonna is gonna affect our actions are gonna affect generations to come. And and the, the actions that we take to mitigate and adapt to climate change will also hopefully benefit generations to come. One, one of the key things here that comes out of that principle from Joe Crona is one of the roles of the teacher is to ensure that learners are ready to learn and such a strong connection to well-being as well. Are we ready? Are we supported to talk about climate change and challenges like climate change in the classroom setting? And our teachers and faculty members supported to be able to engage with their students and support their students as well. So the well-being of students and faculty is, is a key part of this conversation of, of moving things forward in terms of climate action. And the other, the other principles talk about the role of indigenous knowledge, memory, history, and story, patience, and time, Let's and go the, ex the exploration of one's say, identity. Say that, yeah, I'm going to say that. Sorry, I, there's some, okay, there we go. Thank you, there's some background noise. Um, and also the last one is learning involves recognizing that some knowledge is sacred and only shared with permission and or in certain situations. So anyways, we wanted to bring this resource to you. Hopefully you, you, can, you can engage with it and enjoy it. It's really, I think, powerful and empowering um, to bring this to your the circles of teaching and of learning. So we're going to move on to, um, let me move on to our agenda. So we're gonna now finalize sort of the introduction. Sarah is gonna provide some, some background information about the program that we run together and how this session came about really. And then we're gonna introduce you to our panelists, uh, which is the most important part of this session. And we, we're gonna hear from them a bit about what work they're doing, what motivates them to do this work and what things have worked, what things haven't worked and uh, any suggestions that they might have. We'll have time for a discussion from questions from the audience, from all of you. And I think we'll have a, a bit of a conversation among the panelists as well. And we should be wrapping up by 12.25 uh, or 
I just also wanted to briefly um, just review the learning outcomes. These are on the website of the CTLT where the session is uh, announced. So recognizing the significance of incorporating well-being and climate-related content and methodologies within the classroom environments. So the key here is that that into that integration and that close interconnection between well-being and climate change. Acquiring knowledge on how to promote well-being in the classroom and the various resources and tools available with specific considerations for climate content, including addressing anxiety, fostering hope, and building community social connections. And we are hearing, at least from my role here at UBC, I'm hearing more and more from faculty members that climate anxiety is something that's coming up increasingly in their classrooms. And we're hearing from students as well that they that they need the support to be able to um, deal with that anxiety and to engage on these topics in their learning. And the third uh, learning outcome is developing confidence to experiment with at least one novel strategy aimed at enhancing well-being within the classroom. So hopefully you leave today with, with an idea of something that you can try, something new that you can try uh, that will come up from the conversations with our panelists. So lastly, who's around the table? We want to know, I'll introduce you to our panelists, but we want to know who's here, who are you? Um, and uh, Sarah is going to share some polls on in the in the Zoom room with us. We want to know: Are you faculty? Are you student? Are you part of UBC? Are you come, joining us from outside UBC? So, if you can take a minute to respond to that poll, that would be great. And we'll share the results of that poll in a couple of seconds. Okay, thank you so much for responding. Answers are still coming in. There we go. I'm gonna end the poll, share results. Were you gonna do that, Sarah? Sorry. Okay, <laughs> so we have 38% faculty members, 33 staff, 5% students. 19% community members, that's great. And then somebody joining from, I guess, outside UBC, welcome. That's great to hear that we're attracting different different people. Uh, excellent. Okay, that's good for the panelists to know who's in the room. So when we are fielding questions and talking about your experiences, that you keep that in mind. Thank you. And then we also had, oh, is this the next one? Okay, no, share results. I already did that. How do I leave this? Okay, we have a couple of other poll questions that Sarah's gonna put forward. Uh, regarding how confident you feel, what experience you have in working with well-being tools or approaches. And then there's one about climate change as well. Oliver, it's magical. Yeah. We asked them all already. Oh, you asked them all. Yeah. They're all they're all in one. Oh, I didn't miss that. So what were the results for the other two then? Yeah, so I'm looking at the experience with well-being approaches in the classroom and 80% of people have some experience. Um, right. one person has lots of experience and then three people with no experience. And then that's pretty similar to the responses with integrating climate, um, change content into teaching. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Sarah, to do some, a bit of the context. Perfect. Thanks, Oliver. Um, so we're going to, well, I am going to provide you some context of how we came to actually know our panelists through our Climate and Wellbeing Education Grant cohort, which is co-led by Oliver. And um, um, next slide. We just learned we can advance our own slides. It's amazing. Um, so this uh, Climate and Wellbeing Education Grant program that we mentioned, it offers support for a cohort of faculty to integrate climate and well-being content and practices into the classroom particularly while engaging with challenging topics such as climate change. And the cohort of faculty that we have, we've met twice so far, and we're gonna meet another three times next year, where we'll meet together and share progress on the projects, discuss and learn about tools that support well-being in teaching and learning environments, and engage with climate change topics. And building a network of faculty with similar interests in teaching climate and sustainability content is one of the key goals and benefits of the program. So building, building community. And it's also quite um, an interdisciplinary group of faculty. And this year we awarded 12 grants in 11 uh, UBC departments. So four of those departments are gonna be represented here today. 
And what we are really excited about um, is that this year's cohort classes, we estimate that over 3,500 students will be impacted by these um, incorporations of climate and well-being within existing courses. And we're so excited about the ripple effect that adapting existing courses and practices can achieve. So the reach will expand year after year when they're taught. And it just feels like it's a one-time investment that just continues to grow year over year. And so perhaps Oliver, if you want to pop a link into the chat of the Climate and Wellbeing Education Grant Program, you can learn a little bit more and read about some of the projects that we have this year. I, I can't do that because I'm sharing screen and so I don't have access to any other tabs. I'll do I, it. Later. I'll, I'll do that no. yeah, in a minute. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so, you know, why, why are we engaging within this work? Why are the faculty members? Why are staff working on this? Um, the need is... Um, the need to highlight health and well-being and teaching and learning about climate change has been identified, like Oliver mentioned, with faculty, support units, students, and also with the Climate Emergency Task Force report. So it responds to the university's commitment to take climate action as it's declared a climate emergency in 2019. So within that slide in the bottom left-hand cold um, corner where it's circled, um, within the Climate Emergency Task Force report. The priorities that this cohort, this grant program supports is supporting community well-being in the face of a climate crisis and also expanding climate education opportunities and resources for the UBC community and broader public. And we really need to talk about well-being alongside climate given the significant impact of planetary health on human health and well-being. As Oliver mentioned, this grant, it's a collaborative effort between the Sustainability Hub and UBC Wellbeing. And just briefly, um, UBC Wellbeing is a collaborative effort to make the university a better place to live, work and learn through a whole university and settings-based approach to embed wellbeing across our campuses. And the Sustainability Hub's mission is to inspire people to act upon the planet's most urgent sustainability challenges. Now, as we mentioned, we are talking about challenging topics that have many, um, many emotions that come up. And before we get too far in our conversations today, we'd like to share with you a list of resources to support your to support your own well-being as well as the well-being of those around you. So we've listed three main hubs for staff, faculty, and students here on the screen. And I will post a link in the chat later, which is actually the um, resource list that we use within our faculty cohort that digs a bit more into detail into these hubs and some key resources that we'd recommend. All right. Now, before we introduce the panelists, we're so close to doing that um, and explore their motivations for engaging in climate and well-being work, we'd like to start with a grounding question for the entire group. Um, so I'd encourage you use the chat if you're comfortable, but if not, also just share and hold an answer in your head to what emotions, whether it be positive, negative, neutral, come up when you think about climate change? Well, give us all um, maybe one minute to think about that or engage in the chat, however you like. So we're hearing overwhelm, fear, worry, despair, meaningful, frustration, hope, unpredictability, unsure of what I can do as an individual. And again, that weight on individuals that drives me a bit crazy, but we can do everything. Everything matters. Every action counts. Incandescent indignation. Mm -hmm. Somebody shares the uh, above mentioned uh, emotions, but also dread and frustration is always present. The need to work collectively to address this. The limitless, limitless potential for connecting the dots. Yeah, it sounds like a whole variety. Some with some like tiny bit of hope or ways that we feel like we should be approaching this work together and connecting dots. And then also very challenging emotions and ones that many folks in this Zoom room and also students in classrooms, staff and faculty, they're experiencing this ongoing. 
um, and especially within the context of our conversations today in the classroom when approaching climate change content as a topic. So this is um, one of the reasons that we are here jointly talking about approaches to teach and learn about climate and well-being as we need to take care of ourselves and our communities when engaging with these topics and with this work. And our faculty member panelists will have more to share in our discussion, including how they're approaching these considerations um, specifically within their learning environments. So Oliver, over to you. Thank you. So, oops, that skipped there. Who's Sorry, controlling I'll... the size? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna briefly mention who are our panelists and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Um, so we have Sally Stewart from the School of Health and Exercise Sciences in UBC Okanagan, Adrian Yi from the Faculty of Medicine, Tanya Key from the uh, School of Creative Writing and Faculty of Arts, and uh, Avi Lewis from the Department of Geography and Faculty of Arts as well. We want to ask you to maybe in 90 seconds introduce who you are, your role at UBC, what inspires you to do this work, and if you want to share again an emotion that comes up for you when we you think of climate change. And I'm going to pass it over to Sally first. Thank you, Oliver, and good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to kind of see you, but not really. <laughs> Anyways, um, I am super um, pleased to to be here. Uh, just the to to have this opportunity um, in this cohort to work with this grant and to make some change. So I'm very very excited. So um, I'm quite lucky because uh, my area of expertise is actually health and well-being. And so it's just a a lovely fit when this this project came up. So. Um, I teach mostly nutrition and health courses within my my department, so I have just a prime opportunity to to really um, make some some inroads and do some education. Uh, you know, climate, as we just heard, is our our biggest um, issue about health, and I see sort of everything under that. That you know, climate change um, and the health implications there is our umbrella, and everything um, under it can just fit. So I'm super excited about being having the opportunity um, to do this. And when we were talking about the emotions and the consequences of our actions, and I, I try to always flip everything to the positive. It's just kind of in, in my nature and what I do in the classroom. And so I think of what are the positive consequences of what we do and that, yes, everything that we do as an individual does make a difference. And so it's really what I try to instill in, in my students. And my other um, sort of wording or phrasing that I like is evidence-based hope. And, uh you know, there is hope and there is evidence by what we do does make a difference. So I will stop there. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Sally. Uh, over to you, Adrian. Hi, everyone. Um, it's such a privilege for me to be here. Uh, my name is Adrian Yi. I'm on the unceded and traditional territory, Songhi, Esquimo, and Wysanish. Uh, it is such a privilege for me to collaborate with Oliver and his team and to design educational curriculum, educational activities for medical students in planetary health. Uh, we have made a lot of progress. And thanks to that UBC sustainability for the support, we are able to engage patient partners, community members to ground our curriculum to the priorities and the needs and the desire for the uh, on the community-based level. Uh, I also want to say that um, it is all about making incremental change that actually would make a huge difference. I would say two years ago, when I talk about planetary health and our curriculum committee, there was skepticism of why medicine need to engage in teaching in that. Just about four weeks ago, uh, Dean Callagher actually chaired a symposium on planetary health in the evening. It was amazingly attended. So the culture is changing. I think this is the right time for us to work together to connect the dot. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That's super encouraging. Tanya, over to you. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Tanya Kai. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a lecturer with the School of Creative Writing. I teach um, across all the levels. I teach a big 200 level lecture class and then I teach uh, smaller workshop classes and a graduate level workshop. And when I'm not teaching, I write books for kids. Many of my books are about activists. And then the picture books for younger kids are more specifically about climate. So that's how I got interested in things. 
I'm also the mom of two uh, very different teenagers. I have a 19 year old who's in second year university, who's a very big activist. And whenever I complain about things, she says, don't worry, mom, that's one of the systems I'm going to dismantle. Um, and then I have a 16 year old who is much more into uh, physics and computer science and is convinced that um, we, the best hope for humanity is to move us to Mars. Um, so I get the full array of possible responses there. And between that and my writing has really driven me to ask questions about how we help kids explore reactions to the climate emergency. Um, like kids we're writing for, and also how we help students explore that. Thank you, Tanya. Avi, over to you. Um, hi, everyone. Wow. Um, so happy to be in the company of all of you and, and these fantastic panelists that I've gotten to know a little bit. My name is Avi Lewis. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I teach in geography, um, and I'm teaching a course in climate justice for the second time this coming semester. It's the first time that climate justice has been taught as a standalone subject at, at UBC. Um, so I feel a lot of responsibility, opportunity, and, uh, and enthusiasm for this subject. Um, I'm not an academic by training. I've only been teaching at the university level for about the last five years. My first career was as a television host and producer and then a documentary filmmaker. And my climate journey sort of started uh, around 2010 when I started a long six year film project with my partner, Naomi Klein, who wrote a book called This Changes Everything. And I made a film of the same name. Uh, and it was about how the economic logic of our time, of our system, is the ultimate driver of the climate emergency. And we're not actually able to address it without looking at the logic and the worldview that uh, that creates it, that gives rise to it. And so that sort of systemic approach uh, led us into a project called the Leap Manifesto in 2015, uh, which was a, a movement, a social movement based intersectional climate manifesto, climate justice manifesto. The cut line was a call for Canada based on caring for the earth and one another. So this embeddedness of, of, a, of a culture uh, and ethic of care in the way we confront these existential subjects is, is pretty much been what I've been what I've been focused on for uh, for the last couple of decades, almost two decades now. Um, so I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm all in on this and I feel all the feelings all the time. That's me. Thank you, Avi. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go around back, back to you, the, the panelists, and they're going to share with us between three and five minutes, the project, the curriculum project that they're actually working on right now. Um, and if you have questions, please put those in the chat and cause we'll jump into the question section once the four panelists have presented their their work. Um, so if any questions do come up for you, please put them in the chat and Sarah and I will be uh, taking note of those. Okay, so Sally, back to you then, if you want to share the, the work that you're currently doing. All right, thank you And so you can much. control the slides, remember. Okay, all right, so here we go. There we go. All right. So here's my title, Creating Synergy in Teaching and Learning, Linking Climate Action with Nutrition and Wellbeing. So as I indicated, I mostly teach uh, our nutrition sort of compilation of courses within our program for the nurses, um, as well as um, a first year health course, which covers sort of all aspects of well-being. And I also within my nutrition classes and with what I do with the medical school, I do a little bit on physical activity as well. So it's really lovely to, to link these three. So my... Um, I guess my my overarching statement for my work that I do within my teaching and my research area education leadership is nourishing the roots of student well-being for academic success. So I, I'm looking at ways to improve um, the well-being and the academic success of our students and through a, a number of my projects and nourishing, of course, relates to to um, fueling the body well and, and nourishing the body and soul. So I, I like that play on words. Um, so then when this opportunity came up um, around climate, it was a perfect fit for me because um, the, the, the courses have opportunity to impact well-being through changes in climate. And over the last number of years, I've absolutely put some comments in there about, you know, if we're doing my cooking class, we talk about... Um, 
you know, using uh, safe cleaning products or biodegradable cleaning products in the kitchen, or um, we're talking about um, differences between organic and conventional farming and, and the impact of that on, on climate. Or we'll talk about, you know, the packaging that food comes in and recycling. And so we're, we're talking about these things, but what this project um, has been able to me to do is to really focus on developing a more comprehensive and um, and sound units for both of these courses, focusing in the nutrition aspect, and then also one for the health course. So it, again, the, the whole idea here is about increasing the resiliency of both the people and the environment. Um, that's that's our main our mainstay. We need to have the resiliency to do with the challenges in our world. So with the growing evidence of the environmental impact on health, and of the climate crisis we are in, I, I feel both inspired and responsible to take further action to research, revise, and develop content to embed in my courses. So my courses are Heal 100, Introduction and Principles of Health and Wellbeing, and uh, two others in Health and Exercise Sciences or Interdisciplinary, and this is basically Nutrition for the Health Sciences. And so again, my, my aim here is to, to develop more robust curriculum units for both these courses. And again, love the ripple effect. Um, I kind of use that example of filling our bucket and then um, with all these tools and ideas and resources and then sharing that, and that's where we get that, that ripple effect. So just a little bit then about um, what I want to do in terms of the specific course revisions. So um, it's really about building that student awareness, um, their knowledge, their skills, and that self-efficacy and regulation to take action. And a lot when I'm trying to, um, or with anybody, when we're trying to um, help people make behavior changes around health. It's very challenging. Like people know what to do. You know, I need to, you know, they'll comment, oh, I need to eat more fruits and vegetables or move more or whatever it might be. But again, it's, it's not necessarily the knowing, but it's about how to do it. And so when I'm talking about behavior change or mindfulness within um, the health course, then I can bring this into the context of, of um, climate as well. And making the relationship between how climate impacts our well-being, but then how can we change our behaviors to positively impact the, the climate implications? So there's just so many um, overlaps. One of the first things that I teach within um, both these courses is I do a little fun exercise with an egg and balancing um, to show the the dimensions of health and well-being. And of course, one of those is environment and how they all overlap and interact with each other. And uh, so I feel that's a really strong point and it allows me to emphasize the environmental impact a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> again, self-regulation is another um, opportunity about resiliency, um, health behavior change, and of course, that self-regulation about, okay, well, what, what do I need to do to change my behaviors around taking care of the climate? So through this project, I've been able to hire um, a student research assistant. I'm very passionate about including um, students within this work, um, because right now we, we have students that are absolutely scared about the climate, but then willing to take action and wanting to take action. And so I think we have such a prime opportunity to really um, to positively influence our students and hear from them about what they want to do and what they want their world to be like. So I think they're just primed. And if we can um, help, I guess, support and fuel that in the classroom, then that will be will be lovely. So I've got um, my student, we're working together on doing a really in-depth review of literature um, around generally around the interaction between climate and all aspects of health and well-being. And then a little bit more specifically around food and growing and eating practices as well. Um, consistently through the course, I'm always messaging about it. So in every unit that we do within these courses, I always bring it back in consideration of climate or environment. And there's other considerations that I do as well, but just to highlight, this is absolutely one that we always bring it back to. So even if we're talking about um, carbohydrates in my nutrition class, we bring it back to the climate and environment in some way. If we're talking about mindfulness in the health class, we always bring it back 
to climb it. So that messaging is consistently throughout. I also involve guest speakers and expert interviews. And then through all my course projects and assignments with the students, I do the scaffolding of assignments, and then they get to choose what they're passionate about, what they want to change, and, and think about how they want to disseminate it. So they can be unique about how they want to share their research knowledge. And again, in each of these projects, then climate will be a part of whatever their project is um, to, to link that back in. So, um, yeah, so those are some of the, the main things that I am doing within these two courses. But I sort of feel a little bit lucky because my content area of expertise and that I'm teaching is in well-being and health. And so it's just a natural fit. But I'm very excited about this opportunity to really um, hold it in and develop these more comprehensive units. And I have lots of other ideas, and I'm hoping that this will come up in the discussion about whether you're teaching in physics or English or wherever else um, about where we can put um, these aspects of climate in. So I will stop there. Thank you, Sally. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to the discussion and learning uh, tips and tricks of how to incorporate these kind of things in, in our classrooms. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Adrian. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Great. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sally. Uh, did a wonderful job in uh, really kicking start the presentations of how we see planetary health, uh, how we integrate into our curriculum. So in phase one, what we did is we conducted a series of focus group with patient partners and also community members to look at how to build our planetary health curriculum in for the MD program. Uh, it's very clear that from a community perspective, it is important as a physician, you cannot do a good job understanding human body unless you understand the context. So that's actually from the ground of how we build the planetary health curriculum for the MD program is grounded in the community and also understand a bigger picture than just the physician body organ or, or a very disease based approach. So where we are now is we're integrating that into multiple case-based learning. So case-based learning is really important for MD program, particularly in the year one, year two. So it is a space for our learner to explore uh, discovery-based learning and they have a learning objective, they have a case and they are tasked to explore and learn on their own and actually bring back the knowledge to share that uh, with the group. So what we do is now we have four cases where I identified that we will add the clamp planetary health into the discussion. The first one is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The second one is chronic kidney disease, geriatric health, and mental health. So those are the four key cases that will build in curriculum material or maybe podcast and uh, by engaging patient partner to develop podcasts. To, for example, the concept that we have with the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is we plan to invite one of the patient partner that lives in the organ organ, really talk about the experience in like the wildfire, how that affect their health. And then we can actually ground the whole discussion into more reality based rather than just based on a case that is written by a physician or a content experts. So this is where we're going to go in terms of the pedagogical method. Uh, the well-being is really a key conversation that we need to have. One of the biggest worry that we have amongst our table is, even in the team, is the uh, climate anxiety with the um, challenges that we have. As Ali had pointed out, we like to offer what we call evidence-based hope. We also like to empower learners to see how they could influence, how they can advocate, and what change they can make. And hopefully this will help to mitigate the climate change um, anxiety and also improving their well-being. And we're also planning to implement some of the um, integration as well. For example, the uh, discussion around uh, nutrition. And we'll go into the discussion on plant-based diet. Not only plant-based diet is great for the individual patient, also great for our planet. So we constantly identify opportunity to integrate planetary health. The challenges with the MD curriculum is it's really compact and very uh, compressed. So we have to be very strategic in terms of deciding when to engage our learner. 
and also make sure the engagement is meaningful and useful for them. I'm hoping to take any questions. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, if you have questions, please put them in the chat so that we can, at the end of the presentations, address those. Um, excellent. So we'll we'll move on to Tanya. That was impressive, Adrian. Thank you. I'm I've entered into this grant process with two collaborators, Emily Paul Weary and Jordan Scott, and the three of us teach all of the classes in writing for children. And we also write about climate in our own writing. And in doing that, we we question like, how do we tackle the climate emergency through our writing for children? And sometimes people ask me, why do you have to? Um, why can't you just let them be happy? But we can't let kids grow up until they're, you know, 12 or 16 and then say, oh, we forgot to mention there's an emergency. Um, so we, we and we also can't leave them to get all their information from the news or social media because those are not properly curated for children. So we need to find ways to introduce these topics in age appropriate methods. Um, and we want to leave young readers with hope rather than despair, and we want to leave them motivated for action. And we've been feeling more and more that in writing like that ourselves, we we accidentally motivate ourselves and we accidentally inspire ourselves. Um, and we were hoping to pass that along to our students, that ability to provide hope and motivation for students and also to feel that for themselves. So we're looking at the curriculum in a few different classes. Um, 203 is a big lecture class. Um, and we already have a nonfiction assignment in it. So we were thinking, well, if we if we skew that a little bit to be a climate writing assignment, then how can we scaffold that with some useful resources, with some opportunities to talk to other students in small groups um, and collaborate and do some low stakes writing about it. And then when we get to the higher levels, then we're scaffolding differently with interviews with um, climate, with authors and illustrators who are working on climate projects um, with some more intensive collab group collaboration and workshopping. And then most recently in 503, we're going to have some uh, grad students from the Faculty of Science come in to, um, there is a professor there, Laurel Schaefer, who's really interested in science literacy and we're interested in science literacy. And so those students are gonna come in talk to our students about science concepts, and then our students are going to incorporate those science and, and climate concepts into their fiction, and then give it back for an expert review. So there's some really fun collaborations happening, and our hope is that in having our students really focus on what's appropriate for young readers, what what doesn't leave young readers in despair, but gives them avenues for hope and action, that they will like we have kind of accidentally inspired themselves. Thank you, Tanya. And and hearing about the interdisciplinary work that opportunities that the students are having, that's great. That's great. Uh, Abby? Okay. Um, I, I have a, a little bit of a, a slight imposter syndrome. Um, because I'm not a, a PowerPoint person, so I've already admired the elegance and the variety and the, just the complexity of the slides. You see, I take a much more bare bones approach. Um, I, I teach this climate justice course, um, and it is about making the connections uh, among all the different emergencies and crises that we that we face. And so, from the very frame of connecting the dots, um, it, for t teaching and engaging with climate with the climate emergency for me invites a consideration we are we are ourselves in the equation at all times and that that feels sort of like a really organic observation to start from and how we care for ourselves and for each other and for uh, the non-human world and for the the, the earth uh, as a living being and a, and a system of complex systems that's at the center of the way that i think about the climate emergency and and therefore the way that i teach it um the context is the in 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 how i've thought about this uh this presentation is how i think about being in the classroom and teaching climate and the first thing that i think it's important for all of us to acknowledge is that in at this moment in history and we live in a remarkable historical moment which is negative and difficult in many many different intersecting ways students are not all right 
and and neither are any of us. Um, uh, since the pandemic, I think everyone who's been teaching um, has noticed that the capacity to hang in there, to focus, to deliver assignments on time, to to maintain any sense of well being uh, and functionality is reduced for everybody. <laughs> part of it was a couple of years on Zoom. Part part of it is just everything that everyone is going through. Um, but starting from where we are and and recognizing the moment that we're in and the unique challenges of it is also an opportunity to connect and to build solidarity and community in confronting it. Uh, but we have to be honest about the fact that we're teaching and learning about these difficult subjects in a really uniquely difficult time. And seeing and just even articulating that um, for students to feel seen in the difficulties that they face uh, and, and to share our own struggles with these subjects um, is a way of just kind of naming what's going on. And I think it's a really powerful place uh, to start from. The study of climate justice uh, invites us to practice climate justice, and we'll talk more about what people can do. I think there's a shared sense within the climate uh, education and communications and activism space that one of the most effective ways of dealing with our climate anxiety and grief is to do things together in community. Um, and so creating pathways to activism and helping students and ourselves find ways to act that feel meaningful and not performative and not superficial and not part of traps of, of um, meaningless action, but really meaningful uh, action in, in community. This is a really important part of, of, of teaching the, the climate emergency uh, for me. And, you know, I think the principle of care and the care economy, the activities in our society that are that inherently take care are ways that human beings take care of each other and the planet, um, education and healthcare uh, and long term care for seniors and children. These are low carbon sectors of our society, and they're incredibly meaningful caregiving and caring professions uh, and worlds. So it's not just about work, but it really is about uh, the whole uh, human intersected human experience. And so putting those at the center of how we study climate justice is really important for me as well. And, and it's not a stretch, it's, it's central. Finally, um, in the question of context, we are talking about changing culture. And so creating a culture in the classroom of how we talk about these things and deal with these things, how we talk about them is one thing and the, 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 um, the language, but also the praxis, the practice of uh, embedding care in the way we learn together. Uh, both structuring things with this in mind is important and going back to these practices and structures regularly rather than just saying, okay, here's our thing, our nod to climate, and here's our approach, and then we leave it behind and do all the other things that we do. It has to be integrated into all parts of the learning experience. Um, trying to build a culture of care means talking about it and understanding it together and practicing it together. So uh, I'll go through these more quickly because I'll talk about them longer in the discussion, I hope. But uh, we've, I've, through the grant, I've been able to form a little working group with a, with a graduate student and an undergraduate student who took this climate justice course in its first iteration. And so that's been beautiful, uh, beautiful experience for me and for them uh, in the three different sort of levels of the, of the undergraduate experience, the faculty, the TA, and the undergrad to be able to work together and think together about how to embed care and revamp the course the next time uh, we teach it together. So we've talked about, you know, I've got 100 students in this class. I've never taught 100 students before, so I'll be transparent about my own climate education vulnerability with the students when I, when I teach. Uh, but we've divided the class up into smaller groups, and we're going to try to replicate something like a seminar experience in a much bigger class with lots of small group discussion. That requires thinking about the physical space. Do you have tables and chairs that can move if you're in a, a lecture theater, which is designed for one-way transmission of information? How do you create those spaces? So I gave a lot of thought to the room booking process. Um, we're going to have climate wellness act activities embedded in each and every week that we meet. Um, and a, and a lot of these have been generated by the undergrad who took the course uh, last time. And we harvest suggestions from the students themselves, meditations, uh, writing exercises, uh, group discussions and, and, and practices, um, mapping emotions and speaking about them in small groups for 15 minutes every single time we meet uh, as a way of coming in together and acknowledging the climate feelings uh, is gonna be part of our practice. 
And, uh, and I've been thinking about this question of hope, and we'll talk more about it. But I will land each and every class on a moment of hope. Um, and I've, I've thought for many, many years about how to calibrate this. And it's, I just want to say, it's a moving target. What felt hopeful in 2009 doesn't feel realistic now. And so as the, as the climate is unraveling and as our studies and, and pedagogies are evolving, that question of what feels genuinely hopeful needs to keep changing as it does within different constellations of humans in a room. Um, but with, while avoiding the kind of technological fetishism and solutionism and just kind of let's all get out there and do it because no problem, we can do anything. <laughs> like avoiding, avoiding those kinds of hopeful projection that actually make people feel more disempowered and less hopeful and finding a credible hope together. Um, I, I think that's essential and I, I'm sure that will occupy much of our of our discussion. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Avian. I I think we definitely can jump into that question about hope and what what is the hope that we are actually trying to 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 create. Um, but there's there is one question in the chat that I wanted to just lost it that I wanted to mention. Here it is, and I think it's, a few of you have addressed some of this. So, what specific skills do you overtly help students to practice? So um, they're saying I have feedback from some students who want to develop skills to engage in climate action. And while we set them up to engage, we have not yet identified and helped them develop specific skills. So wondering if you can articulate those. So this is a question for all four of you. Go Adrian, don't wait. Otherwise you'll just, you'll just languish there in the box. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not quite the talk show host yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so fun for us to have this conversation, right? Because um, this is a really tough subject and it requires many perspectives. And I don't have the monopoly of wisdom on how best to do this. Uh, one of the key aspects of medical education is changing is a lot of the facts, a lot of content is widely available on here. So the role of the MD program is really focused on working in the team, communications, empathy, compassion, and also seeing medicine as a holistic team-based activity. Uh, I think the challenges that we have is really how we embed into the curriculum that is overpacked. I'm gonna pick an example that in the medical world, there is choosing wisely. So choosing wisely is a set of guidelines that uh, really educating doctors on how to use resource in a way that is sustainable and wise and useful, effective for patient care. It was a huge challenge to launch that because anytime we launch that, people talk about, we just want to save money. But now we actually change the conversation around is, is this sustainable? Anytime we order a CAT scan, that is a necessary CAT scan is a multi-dimensional modeling of imaging there's always come with iodine contrast. I don't know where this iodine contrast goes. I'm sure it goes directly into the ocean. So this is where we are changing the conversation and really making sure our learner knows how to think about sustainability when they go out to practice. That would go a long way. I think in engaging students too, we can think about the different comfort levels and skills of those students and not everybody has to engage in the same way and I think the more we can acknowledge that more the more we can include more people some some of us are willing to get out there and occupy spaces or hold signs or shout and cheer and you know I teach classes of extreme introverts but they're great writers so can they write letters to the editor can they write um, manuscripts and can they do can they do research that then will help support the people who are out there um, talking and, and demanding. I think that we can find different roles for different types of people to play. Kenny, I think that's really great because I, I, I feel like that, that question can be flipped on its head really easily. It's more a question of mapping what your what your skills are or what your proclivities are to uh, to a group or to an action or to a campaign. It's more about finding um, a, a, a lane of action that resonates with you 
and then figuring out because I, I, I've learned a lot of things because I needed them for something that I wanted to do. So I didn't necessarily look at what am I good at? <laughs> I thought, what do I want to what do I want to achieve? I'm really drawn to this leap manifesto thing. Oh, my God, we got to hold a press conference, a national press conference at the Toronto Film Festival. I need to figure out how to book a room and a camera. And so when people get into activism, they learn things for purpose. And that's a very powerful way of learning. And as well, you know, you don't want to say there's one way to do this, because then people who don't feel comfortable in that kind of activism don't feel included. So it really is sort of putting out menus of possible campaigns, of activist groups, of types of action, um, connecting people to others. We can't solve these problems and these questions alone. It's about getting in a room with people who are aligned and figuring out what you want to do together. And even that basic value is something that leads students on a path where they can figure out what skills they need. Then they're really motivated to, to develop them. Maybe I'll just jump jump in here too. So coming a little bit more from an, an individual, because again, when I'm helping students build skills for health behavior change, again, this fits in here. And so sometimes it's just as simple as getting the students to brainstorm about what are little things that you can do in your everyday life and maybe divide them into groups. Okay, think of you having your morning shower. What can you do? You know, okay, well, it's about using, um, you know, biodegradable soaps and you're going to to the grocery store okay let's you know take your own shopping bags and your own jars for the bulk rather than packaging so it's about getting them to brainstorm and and, and start chatting about it and realizing and setting goals okay I can do this one change this week so again it makes them um, it's starting building their skills again of self-regulation that they can make a difference. And if everybody's doing it, you're role modeling it for your roommates or let your mom and dad know or whatever it is, then there's that ripple effect. And by them doing it, it becomes their practice. So they're building that skills. And then what can I do next week? And, you know, when they're doing that, then they're also talking about it as well. And again, then that is another, another ripple effect. So, and then I think it helps build their, their realization and their confidence that, oh, uh, okay, I can do this. So what can I do next? Um, so I think that's just, you know, starting very simplistically and it's very um, easy to integrate into a classroom. And as Adrian was saying, we are so full, like our courses are full. And so how do we add this in? And this has been a big part of um, some of my educational leadership research where I've been trying to help faculty members integrate well-being practices within their classroom because I don't have time to teach more and I'm not a well-being expert but how can we just integrate it and so these these tips on what can we do specifically for the climate are then other things that we're trying to just be how can we integrate this into um our our classroom and another example is often I see students coming in and they're drinking they got their water bottles or they're eating snacks or their lunch or something and that's another way to bring it up like oh well what do you mean or or, oh, great, it's nice to see that that's in a recyclable container. So calling students in and acknowledging and making them more aware. And it's like, oh, okay. So sometimes that can be really inspiring. Then they start holding each other accountable as well. It's quite fun. Thank you. I think there's a, there's one, one, I just want to add one last little footnote on, on Sally's riff, which I think is a great sort of uh, um, kind of a vision of where people start in their daily lives. Um, but also we have to recognize that this is about systems and structures and students are really attuned to the fact that they've seen a couple of decades of sort of individual based actions, which, um, which have been limited in their effect. And while they can be incredible gateway drugs, I, I feel like also students sort of that that can lead to a kind of a, well, what is it, what can one person do is, is a thing that you often hear in these mm -hmm. conversations and that, but, but, but starting at the level of, of personal action can lead to an understanding of systems. So you yeah. can eat more healthy and you can make more healthy food choices, but what is the food system? Is yeah. the food system healthy? If the food system as an economy, as a structural element of society is actually part of the climate emergency problem, then thinking about our personal food choices can lead us into a, a contemplation of the systems. And yeah. that can lead to places where people can have very meaningful activist uh, avenues that actually deal with the systems and not just with the individual level. So can, there's many ways that you can yeah. find a path. And, and that's where that everybody everybody counts, right? Whether those people that are being the activists or they're doing their little thing at home. So we need everybody, right? So yeah, thank you. I see some hands up. 
Yeah, and maybe I'll just um, going in order. Um, so Matt had a question that actually, Avi, you were already starting to speak to. So I'll leave some space if there's any other points that people want to add. And then I'll get to the lovely polite hand as well and more in the chat. So Matt was wondering, how do you talk about spheres of influence? Example the actions at individual community, then policy and systems level. Do you find that students feel overwhelmed with not knowing where um, where to begin and how to influence meaningful levels of change? Just a little bit linked to, to Coco's comment about, um, you know, where people can safely feel like they can engage in climate action given various reasons for not um, being able to engage in all types of action. Can I? Start just with a little simple comment, Sarah. Again, when we're looking at when we're looking at course assignments, um, so again, I have my students who are doing review of literature on various areas, but and then I even think of of just think of like just think like I'm even thinking why are English cucumbers all individually wrapped in plastic? Like, why don't you go and find that out? And and I get them writing a letter. Maybe it's writing a letter to whoever is doing that. So it's just getting them to think about these things sometimes that we take for granted in our everyday life. Critically think about it and going like, oh, why is this? And then what what can you do? What action, what is your first step in doing this? And it can be conversations. Again, when the students start talking together and we can scaffold that, then they start thinking of ideas and then get them acting on it. So they're learning a ton of skills within that. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the issue coming up in medical education literature is the burnout from the advocacy role. Uh, people are exhausted, including us and also the learner as well. What you don't want to project is they can change the world during their medical education. That is not a realistic perspective. But what you can teach them, whether whatever program they have, what is the individual steps that you can take and what is realistic and how this is going to go through that in terms of the process and coaching them through the process whether that is advocacy, whether that is habit change, how you counsel on patients. Uh, we engage uh, Dr. Melissa Lam, I'm sure some of you know who Dr. Lam is, uh, to really help us deliver a session on mindfulness and also coaching a patient through mental health, through the green or park prescription. I think at this little step that actually cumulatively would make a difference. Uh, we do not go out and say they can change the world. That is unrealistic. I wonder if I, that's an interesting point about burnout from advocacy. And I think it's also a really good point that Coco made about intersectionality about and about how all of our students are not starting from a level playing field and not all are equally able to do some of this big work. And I wonder if in our assignments that we're giving, um, if maybe if the rest of you have found ways to tailor assignments so that students can take on what they're ready for. Like in, in my case, that might be like we're writing climate writing for children. You can choose to write um, about a cool animal or plant, or you can choose to profile an activist, or you can choose to um, write about indigenous forest management. Like those might be different levels that somebody could engage in. Avi, have you I found any of that in your social yeah, I mean, yeah, like I, I, I definitely feel that that this is sort of about recognizing who's in the room, understanding and and articulating the value of true diversity and that we're all at different stages in this journey. We all have different abilities and different ways of dealing with things. Um, I'm hoping that I'll have a bigger physical volume of air in January than I had last time I taught this course, but I taught my course in a mask and and I'm put on the syllabus and I and it was I hated it. It sucked. Um, but I, I lectured in a mask and I wore my mask in class at all times. And I made the case to the students that caring about each other and seeing and, and trying to create cultures of practice that value the most vulnerable among us um, as much as anyone else, that's a central value of climate justice. And wearing my mask, because I don't know who's vulnerable. I don't know who is living in is with an immunocompromised person at home. <laughs> we take care of each other by showing care. And that that was a way that I showed care for everyone around me um, was like something quite powerful and difficult 
Um, and, you know, in the first couple of weeks, all the students put on their masks, you know, really felt it. And, and it, then it drifted, you know, and by the end of the course, I was the only one wearing a mask. But th- like things like that, where you actually connect the values to the practice and the praxis, I think are, are incredibly valuable. And uh, another thing that, that I found re- works really well is when you have guests, I mean, Melissa Lem is a superhero of the climate movement. Um, but any anyone who's engaged in climate who comes into the classroom, their story of how they got involved, their story, their origin story of climate activism, and looking for those in literature, research, film, and and video is really important because there's nothing like a personal story to make something real for someone. And and to see how other people found their way into activism demystifies it, make it makes it seem less intimidating. Um, and you don't see like the super activist as the finished product model of what you're supposed to be, but you actually see people's vulnerabilities, uncertainties, missteps and 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 roundabout paths to where they've where they've landed. And that I think is really, really a much more human way of conveying how activism can play a, a meaningful role in our lives. Um, not as a not as something like the yeah the burnout factor for feeling like you have to save the world is real and uh, just understanding that we're all trying to find our way together in this is a much more inclusive way of of addressing it. I think um, Milani, you've been very patient with your hand up. The room is yours. Awesome, thank you. Um... I have a question for Avi or really anyone who wants to answer, but I teach a class in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. That's a first year class and it's really centered around um, introducing the food system. And we talk about climate change and we talk about a number of different things. And one thing that I have noticed in the students writing is this emphasis on personal responsibility and um, awareness, raising awareness about things and Uh, My hope is like through the term that we like shift that kind of or add to that perspective in a way that is more systems based. And I actually haven't found like a lot of great resources for making that shift. And I'm wondering if anyone has those, because one of the things that I um, see and wonder about is like, on one hand, thinking that there's such a, a big space for your own personal contribution does and there is an empowerment piece to that and feeling like you can be a part of change but then there is also this it's such a big problem to take on as an individual and I don't want them to feel overwhelmed and I also think that it's a bit of a misconception in terms of like the proportion of change that is made by an individual I'm hoping someone can speak to that I'll try to be quick because I've got this question so many times in Q and A's going back to film screenings like many years ago, but everybody wants to know what can I do? And one of the ways I've, you know, what can I as one person do? And one of the ways that I've heard that question answered, and I've tried to answer it sometimes myself is to be honest, not that much, but if you can get with a bunch of other people, (laughs) you can do tons of stuff because we have to address this deeply neoliberal individualist culture where we take individual responsibility and we see individual actions as solutions, um, there's definitely a venue for that. But it's just, it, it disempowers people when they think it's all on them. And so when you emphasize the need for connection and community, and this is where social movements play such a huge role in the food system, you know, you start learning about Via Campesina, the global movement of peasant farmers and the agroecological approaches to, to food production, you suddenly realize there's people who have been working on this for generations. And it's not you as a lone Canadian food consumer that's going to solve this problem. But there are people who have been thinking about this and acting on this for a long time all over the world. You feel less alone and you start to see other ways of making change. I think think we also have students who have amazing levels of involvement that we don't always recognize. So sometimes if we can send it back to our students and say, you know, go find out about an organization that's doing really cool work um, that needs writers to help them and then come back and tell the rest of us about it. Because I guess, especially in writing, I have students who are coming from many different faculties and many different backgrounds. Sometimes questions like that lead to amazing things that I never would have thought of. Um, But then they bring it back to the group and then hopefully it does have that ripple effect from there. Yeah. And just building on that too, it's, you know, when when we're in a class, you know, we're talking about individual, but yet 
if we're in a classroom, okay, here we are. We are a team of 300 people all doing this. So then again, it takes that individual piece out of it because it almost makes the students feel more accountable. Like, wow, this is my team of 300. And, and so I think that might help a little bit. One of the other things too is, um, I often bring up the the three um, sort of characteristics of self compassion, and one of them is the common humanity, or and that we're all in this together. And so again, I think sometimes realizing that that we're not alone is and and sort of because that totally fits into well being. Um, so again, it's a component of my classes, but that fits into well being. So linking climate again to that common humanity, um, and that we're all in this together and can work together um, on this. Yeah. I spend a lot of time uh, when I mentor medical students, it's actually talk about imposter syndrome. I think we all have that. And uh, the only person that does not have that show up at the six o'clock news on Fox News every week. I'm not sure you want that person to be in your class either. Uh, this is real and it is normal. How they feel is they feel there's no power. They don't have agency. A lot of time what I said was harness your strength. Doesn't matter what you are. If you're not comfortable in public speaking, maybe you're amazing in building relationship. So go out to build relationship with your colleagues and with the community members and really harness your strength. And to do this, this is a team sports, right? This is not an individual responsibility to change the whole culture it is really unrealistic. Tanya, did you want to add anything? I was just going to say to Adrian that you're working in a massive bureaucracy. So that's an added level of um, weight on people. And it must feel hard to change sometimes, but hopefully small steps. You learn pretty quickly what to present at the curriculum committee, what to say and what not to say. <laughs> I think this maybe segues into Charlotte's question in the chat. And then Catherine, I see your hand up. Um, next. So it is about integrating climate into full curricula. Are there strategies to help faculty to make these decisions? So what to keep, what to add, how to make climate relevant to the students and the course? I mean, I'm blessed to teach it just head on and it's the subject of, of the course. And so I feel like I, 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 I'm really anxious to hear from others on, on this too, because if I were teaching something that weren't explicitly climate related, I don't know how I would necessarily start. I do know that, that, that an intersectional approach and seeing the crises that we face as a society as linked, the health crisis, the crisis in our healthcare system, the housing crisis, the cost of living crisis, the transportation crisis of how hard it is for students to get around and for people to get from where they can afford to live to where they work, they're all linked. Um, and they all share uh, a point of connection in our, in our economy that is also driving the climate emergency. So when you start to see the connections among the various challenges in our society, they do give you a way to connect all of the different challenges together. That I have found since the Leap Manifesto did that in 2015 in an explicit way has been a really helpful tool for people to connect the dots. And then you're suddenly talking about systems rather than about uh, problems in isolation. But if I was teaching just, um, you know, like Adrian, the kind of work that you do, um, I guess you need to go to personal health and planetary health and the connection between them. Maybe we could all brainstorm on other connective tissue that leads us to the climate. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing a, a comment in here um, from Sarah. I love that. Yeah. I would love to see every student graduate from UBC having had an opportunity to link their specialization to the climate crisis. And um, I'm, I'm right there along with you because again, this is my thing I uh, with the development of my first year health course, right? We all need to have um, health and wellness to do what we're going to do. And that does now, it does include, um, you know, the climate crisis and taking care of that. And um, so again, I, I, we need to look at ways to just like, how can we put this in here? So, you know, I think it's about 
raising awareness in the class. So if we're in a stats class, then, you know, when they've got an assignment to do, you know, just put some in there, like um, as Adrian does case studies, then can you put in there, okay, I want somebody researching the stats on, you know, the emissions from um, raising cattle or whatever it might be. So you can put those in, or if you're doing physics or chemistry, there's ways of, of relating it and specifically maybe outlining a topic that is related to climate and then, and then pulling them in. Like, you know, I brought this up because we need to address these issues. So it can just, it can be a simple point of context about why that was, that was put in there. So it, I, I think it's, I, I can't see any course or discipline that does not relate to it somehow. And even in just general conversations, as we try to connect with our students, hey, how did you get to campus today? Or, wow, I noticed you're soaking wet. You know, did you ride in the rain? Or, you know, there's just so many other ways too um, with, with trying to connect with our students what, that we're able to bring those into the conversations. One other thing that I noticed when we did the little poll at the beginning that we also have a lot of staff members on here. And again, I'm thinking you are in such an amazing position to change systems. So if you, whatever role you have as staff, you know, I'm thinking, you know, ordering um, equipment for offices. Are you organizing um, uh, like lunches or whatever it might be? And there's so many decisions that you can make that can be benefit the um, the environment and that can help change systems like asking the cafeteria, we're doing this, we're catering this, do you have this, right? So um, just thinking of lots of different ideas there. I think Sarah's question is is, is hanging there and I, 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 I welcome anyone else to take it on too. It's like, imagine a day when, when everyone who went through a degree at UBC encountered an embodied climate and 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 with a healthy emphasis on well-being and in, in its approach at some point in their degree. I mean, that would be a whole of institution response to the emergency in keeping with the UBC climate uh, emergency declaration and many of the resources that and need to be the resources that need to be refreshed to actually maintain this focus and expand it to every single student experience. That would that that's something worth fighting for, in my view. So true. Katie, you ready, you ready to jump in here, Katie? <laughs> yes. So um, a, a, just a quick comment and then a question. Thank you all so much for um, everything you've said so far. And one thing I did want to add, I, I like Avi, I teach in geography and so sort of a natural fit. I'm already teaching about climate and I have a specific section that is just focused on humans and the environment. And I just finished up my, I think, ninth or tenth offering of this course and I made the slightest change in my presentation that like vastly changed how students received it, um, which and this was an introductory level course. And I put like a list of actionable items on in every you know PowerPoint that I posted and framed it much more around what they can do. And it was amazing the response I had from students just in that little and I'm not even necessarily talking like fancy stuff, just, you know, I Googled like what can you do to help biodiversity on the day we're talking about biodiversity and just giving them like a small actionable item like that I found really helped um but one question I just wanted to ask and this is more of a pedagogical nature and the sort of intrinsic versus extrinsic you know decisions about uh, about like students are also getting a grade so how are you incorporating some of this into the grading aspect um uh and and how do you especially in the large classes deal with issues of absenteeism um in specifically in relation to these you know these types of activities not 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 in general so thank you very much for that thanks Catherine and it's really neat when we have those like wow moments when we do something and it's like oh my gosh this so worked right so it's funny like I just wrote that down because um something I do in my nutrition classes for each of my units, I do a, a, a recipe that is related to our topic, but I can also do this as well. Like, cause I do a like, consistent messaging, but I kind of like that little um, thing that, yeah. And we can all do that somehow related to whatever we're talking about or teaching. Uh, so that's a fun idea. Um, um, oh, the grading piece. And I, I totally forgot your question. Sorry about that. So the grading piece is um, I, absolutely have 
questions on my final exams that relate back to this. Because if it's been consistent messaging, we relate it to course content, then it is a part of course content. And so and so I, I talk about that. And when I do the review study guides, it's on my review study guides to make sure that, yes, this is related to the topic. You know, these were some of the main points that we discussed around this um, uh, this issue of, of climate crisis related to our course. And so that's how I put it. And then two, I give them the option on assignments if they can relate it into their topic of their assignment. So just in their topic choice. And on the topic of grading, I grade the writing assignments, um, but I also give completion marks for the collaborative portion um, with a partner, with a small group and for a reflection portion. So if you were, weren't coming to the class and just doing the assignment, um, you would still do okay, but if you want to excel, you have to participate in that collaborative and reflective part. That's the only way I found. And Catherine, thank you for bringing up the absent issue. Uh, we are struggling a lot about uh, learner not being present, whether that is a mandatory learning sessions or lectures that currently is not mandatory in the MD program. If anyone has any solution, please share that because I'm running out of solution of that. Uh, short of having a QR code to check in, but I cannot see myself running the high school program. This is not right. So we got to have some better ideas of how to engage our learners. Adrian, just to add bribing, bribing with candy is not is not in vogue these days. But I guess that's not a that's yeah. Don't 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 don't, don't write that down. The absenteeism is an, is a challenging thing, and I think it's definitely become more of an issue um, since COVID because we were relying um, on Zoom and recorded lectures, and then it was sort of afterwards that well we should still be recording in case somebody still does have COVID so they can still attend and so it's such a gray area but I think too that I'm starting to pull back a little bit um, in terms of of recording so this fall term I was not recording because my class was fully in person the only time I did because I have some um, uh, nursing students for example that are also um, parents and they specifically asked, you know, Dr. Sally, can you please record today? Because I'm at home with the, you know, and so I have done that. But we are an in-person institution for the most point. And these are adult learners. And um, the classroom is, is where we get the most learning. Um, I say it's the most efficient way to go through a course is to be in class, because you miss so much we can't you, you know, you've got textbooks, but you can't replace the discussion, the connection, the learning peer to peer that goes on in that classroom. It's just irreplaceable. So I'm just really trying to advocate for that. Um, and there's there's still challenges, but it's a really, really tough thing. Um, I also sit on Senate um, for the Learning and Research Committee, and this, this has come up a lot. So um, it's, I think it's just an ongoing conversation, but very, very challenging, but I'm keen if anybody has any thoughts, interests, like, please don't hesitate to email me anytime, but I think it's a very good point. To you know, I, I tried to split the difference on, on, on that um, because I really wanted people to encourage my students to stay home if they're not well and not feel like exactly, they yeah. definitely have to miss something. So I recorded my lectures, but I only made them available for the week. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, you know, it was a kind of attempt to have a both and. Right. So if you miss a lecture, okay, you catch up with it within a week or so, it could be a couple, but you don't, you know, from the very beginning, and I've reiterated a bunch of times, you can't just miss, avoid the class and, and watch all the lectures, you know, right before the end of term, they're not going to be there. So it really was an attempt to, to compromise. I don't know. I don't, I, I should talk to more students and find out how it worked for them, but I thought it was moderately successful anyway. Yeah, and then we get the the other comment. Well, then I don't have to commute, right? So then there's less gas emissions and improving exactly. <laughs> What are we going to do? I do feel like the, the our conversation about hope is is still 
um, kind of hanging in the air, although it's been threaded through everything we've talked about. I, I, I just wanted to share that I, I'm watching the COP28 go on in Dubai. Um, it, it's, it's that process is uh, a really contested one now. There's lots of prominent climate scientists and activists who are saying there's no point. There's more fossil fuel lobbyists than there are country delegates at the cops now they're 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 a captured space there are others who are there and saying we're finally talking about fossil fuels but you know not sharing things as i think there's an element that like true sharing climate truth about how bad the situation is in material terms um and recognizing that it can be difficult information to get but grounding our teaching in the reality of where we're at and acknowledging that there are some things that are debatable, like all of the actions are ongoing live debates. So whether or not the international negotiation process under the UN um, is a valuable thing to be doing, you could present it a for and against. But if you just present anything as the sole solution or the only way to go, um, students have really developed radar now where they see the other side. And if you preach, you know, the gospel of electric vehicles, people understand that the extraction of lithium in, in, in the global South um, and in marginalized communities is a huge problem and that we can't unleash an extraction frenzy because we're shifting to electric vehicles. Um, on the other hand, I found that students understood that dimension of the lithium rush so well and its possible negative consequences that they started to question whether electric vehicles were even worth it. And we know scientifically they absolutely are. What's the problem is like individual car culture. If we have more public transit and mass transit, that is a real climate solution that can be electrified and be more democratic and help people with less resources. So it's like exploring all of these things as ongoing debates and not presenting solutions as perfect um, I think is a big is an important part, and this thing of solutionism and the rah rah we can do this um, rings a little hollow these days. I think we need to calibrate the kind of hope that we offer as gentler, less certain, and less all encompassing. And it may land, even though it's less energetic, it may land more deeply with 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 our learning community because it's uh, it's more it's more where people are at. Um, searching rather than kind of riding to the rescue. Thank you, Avi. And I'm just looking at the time. We're about one minute to close. And I do see there's some big questions in the chat as well, too. But I think in closing along the theme that Avi just brought up, I'm just wondering if we can each rapidly um, of the panelists share any advice you have for others if they wanted to take one key first action in this area of climate and well-being content and pedagogy. So maybe um Tanya, if you want to go and then tag someone else. I would we... say that I, I think we don't have to wait to be experts to guide these discussions. Like we can dive in there with the students and figure things out together. Thanks, Tanya. Sally? Oh, you're muted. Muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I uh, thank you. I just think it's really about trying to integrate it and just bring it into our conversations when in whatever we are teaching. And, um, you know, I see a question here about data. And I think, um, it, you know, we know that it is our number one health issue right now. So even just let alone that, but then also bringing in data that's related to your area of um of content, like to bring in some relative data there, I think is really, really helpful. And, um, and I think as part of our goal, we are so lucky to have the leadership from the sustainability and the climate hub. And I, I feel now a, a responsibility with having this grant is that, you know, what we get from our grant and the work that we do is sharing that and, and continuing um, the, the, the leadership. And so just continue with that evidence-based hope and just trying to integrate it and continue your, your the messaging throughout. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Adrian? I just want to reshare what I heard at the start of this meeting. Education should be holistic, relational, and reciprocal. I think it will go a long way if we embed all three values into how we design education activities for our learners. Thank you. That's it, exactly. That's it, exactly. Don't try this alone at home. It's got to be our first message, right? 
find your people, get in, in relation with others, and let's confront this as communities. I love that. Thank you all so much for those wonderful parting words. Thank you all for being here and joining in the discussion. None of our pre-formulated questions were asked, which is the best <laughs> session possible. Thank you to CTLT for hosting this space. And we hope you all have an excellent rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And I'm Thanks, happy. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Any emails if anybody has questions. Mm -hmm.